My third score for this final Sunday is from Miranda. And Miranda, it's great to get a score from you. And you've got so many ideas in here that work fantastically well and so many really cool ideas as well, just like little, um, you know, little touches that are fun. Um, and then there's some other things that are are pretty out of balance. Do you know what I mean? There are, like, most of the textures pretty much work. And, like, the approaches work sometimes maybe a little too well. Um, but, but you know, but, but it's just a question of, of, like, finesse and balance and proportion, right? And I think that those are things that you need to work on in your orchestration. All right. Um, one little thing here for people to know and that is this tenor sax part is in C. In fact this entire score is in C but it is sounding down an octave, right? So the best way to deal with this, if you just know this is going to be a C score only, is to um, uh, grab this guy right here, right? And just put it there and then that, that lets the score reader, the conductor, know right away that they're hearing, you know, this E for instance is the same as this E here in bassoon. But I'll just remove that because I don't want to mess with this. Okay. So, first page starts out very paced. Do you know what I mean? And at first, it works really well, I feel. Like, we've got uh, piano accent. <clears throat> and I think that you don't need to mark every single accent. You can do a bar of accents and then just, like, say, sim after that. S-I-M period. And it kind of keeps the part from looking too clunky. Uh, just more elegant for the for the player to read. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting a little clogged up. The patterning is pretty cool, just like all strings, and with this kind of you know this sort of pulsing support behind it, it's very nice. Uh, just you know, just so long as the accents are you know piano accent, right, and not mezzo forte. <laughs> <clears throat> And I like the way that the that the accents as the the pacing contributes to the melody. That's very cool in the uh, in the upper parts. <coughs> Sorry. Now, as we go along, you really do have to tell us <coughs> how many players of each are involved in any one part. Like for instance, here, like I'm assuming that this is just first horn, or maybe you know second horn or something like that, since it's a lower part. And same thing here, like, is this two trumpets, one trumpet? Which trumpet? The first trumpet or the second trumpet? So you have to tell us all the way through. Of course, it doesn't matter if there is only one on a part, like one tuba. You don't have to tell us that. But like, for instance, here, all of these parts that are playing intervals, right? It didn't matter when you were when you had these octaves in here. Obviously, the first is playing the top and the second is playing the bottom. But once you condense things down to a single line, you have to tell us whether or not this is the first or second player, whether they're playing a two, right? So you'd either have one period, two period, or a two, right? Some people have been using a one. Don't don't use a one, right? That's not a thing. So <clears throat> one other thing too. Excuse me, I'm just really uh, feeling congested right now. <clears throat> Um, it would have been better for you to just have separate instruments rather than percussion one and percussion two, because look at how easy it is to be forgetful, right? Like, what what indication does the conductor have that this is a bass drum and that this is a tubular bell, right? You forgot to put them in. But look, if each each of the percussion instruments has a dedicated line, then you don't have to say percussion one and percussion two. And also... You know, we as orchestrators have to really avoid assigning the uh, instruments <coughs> to the players and saying, okay, I've got this all worked out, and you're going to do this, and then you're going to do that. And then you might not even realize that just the way that the score works, it would be easier for them to actually be doing different parts, right? So it's really, it's it's better just to have every single percussion instrument on, on a separately named staff so you don't have to worry about it you know each one it's right there in the left hand margin and you know you just know what it is and then the, the conductor is much less confused and so on 
<clears throat> so this is nice as well, like having tubular bell be part of the melody. That's so cool. And then right in here, it just really gives it a nice chiming, you know, sort of like maybe it's a it's a morning and the uh, and the seamstress is doing her work and then the bells outside, you know, are chiming uh, 8 a.m., right? I'm just counting how, how many there are. So it was 8 a.m. It's the beginning of her morning. Now, you've got so much mass sitting on on the uh, the strings. You know, you've got octave strings that it's great that you've got the harps marked ottava, but you shouldn't be marking them piano. You should be marking them, like I see you've got a, like in hidden text, you've got mezzo forte. Go ahead and mark it mezzo forte, right? You don't, you know, just that should be, that should be the dynamic here anyway, right? You just get rid of this piano mark. Ugh, sorry. Objects are getting in the way of each other. Right, and then just uh, turn that back into, yeah, and that's fine. And then you don't even need this, right? That does, that's completely not needed because the harp is, is such a gentle instrument. You know, it's like an acoustic guitar on stage trying to compete with all these violins. So just, you know, just go ahead and, and mark it up, right? It should be louder just as it is. Now, when you start to bring in timpani here and then... Uh, tuba playing an octave below the timpani, right, and just really contributing in a firm way, and like, and then double bass. Excuse me, not double bass, bass drum as well. You have got such firm pacing. Do you know what I mean? Is there possibly a chance that that pacing is going to start to become tiring to the audience? You know, just sort of like kind of feel like a sledgehammer after a while, just continuously pounding out that uh, baton stroke. You know, just boom boom, boom, going on and on and on. So maybe there's a way of, of being a bit more judicious about it. Remember, I was just kind of talking about like proportion, right? So so do we really want this proportion to to be like this? Like, and if we're going to bring in so much percussion and, and, you know, tuba and everything else, wouldn't it possibly be a good place to proportion it out by having some contribution from the brass as well, right? Um you know, and maybe the strings could be balancing some of that by by doubling some of these lines. All the same, you know, it's still pretty cool. You've got a triple octave here of uh, flutes, uh, oboe plus clarinet, and uh, tenor sax plus bassoon. And and here I would say, yeah, just all parts a two is probably just the way to go, right? Unless they're playing intervals like these octaves. Now. Notice how low you push this tuba, like all the way down to F. Now this is just going to be a hugely profound note. It will, like, like at Sforzando, it will outplay those double basses so easily, right? And um, this timpani struck as well, Sforzando, wit plus double bass, right? It's just going to just swamp everything. In ter and, and, you know, in terms of pacing, it's just really going to continue to push. Now up to there... I think you could get away with it, but then you continue to use tuba and timpani, and you don't correct their like, like you know, you kind of assume that this is soft, right? This, you you mark uh, pianissimo here. You probably intended to mark pianissimo here, and probably also here. But this is just you know, there since we don't have any guide, right? Um, you might be able to achieve everything that you want right here by just completely getting rid of the timpani and the tuba and just marking pizzicato on your double basses, right? Pizzicato with tenuto marks, but still soft, right? And then you just get all that same sense of, of pacing without it being so firm. Like right in here, you could tell with a mock-up, like the, the playback engine hadn't been told to back off on its, uh, on its firm support. So it, you know, it just continued to sort of thump away at those. Uh, nice to have trombones right in there and the horns, Right, to be the ones doing the timekeeping. Right? But it's still just so much weight in here. This has to be marked down way down in volume. Right? In order for the the strings not to be um not to be overwhelmed, right? Good contrast between wind and string groups, by the way. 
Okay, now we're coming back to tubular bells, this time plus glockenspiel and harp. So here you have uh, glockenspiel and harp playing, um, basically playing uh, uh, the same note, right? So cause, because um, ottava, yeah, so it's, yeah, this is, this is basically notated to be the same because glockenspiel is, is quinticesima, so the, it's up two octaves. And then this, of course, is up two octaves from this written, these written pitches for harp. So, um, it just really, once again, is a question of, is, is it audible, right? Um, glockenspiel plus harp, the harp is at a disadvantage and it sort of gets swamped. So, wouldn't it be better to just like have, um, harp octaves? playing along with this, right? So just like like both hands are would be playing this. Uh, and then that would help to compete with what's going on with the um, with the violins. But none of that is going to come out if this brass is, in, is still loud and you still have um, timpani kind of thumping along here at the bottom, right? So yeah, so just maybe some of these things went on a little bit too long. Um, right? Then we've got... Um, you know, tubular bell contributing as well. I like that a lot. Really, really huge tutti here. Big contrasts. Uh, harp is completely useless here. These, these, uh, this last beat here, these last baton stroke is is not going to be heard at all. Like if you did a glissando in there, it would be heard. And kind of the same thing is true of um, of like glockenspiel. Like glockenspiel is such a delicate sound, right? If it were playing on its very highest pitches, right, which you don't really get that high C sharp, but if you were to jump up with this, like this F sharp and G sharp, you know, to double up here, um, you know, at an octave higher, then you might just be able to hear that. But like where it is right there, it just doesn't project very much, and it's like it's very, very hard to have it sound out. Now, if you had a, uh, a xylophone, that would easily sound, but like. Both both of these instruments are kind of useless here, um, yeah. But you know, very very firm, um, and I, I like the fact that you you know you go opposite directions, like going quite you know going so high, like going all the way above middle C, with the you know, yeah, and, and you know even way up here, right? Just kind of pulling in opposite directions. That's very cool. Now here, just one last comment here. Um, you can just say consort and then um, sends a sword, or you can just like mark these. I guess you know since this is um, this is a C score, so it kind of doesn't look like these would be very good notes to stop. But actually, since they are written up a fifth, they are perfectly good notes to stop. Right. So I would say have have this a two, so two horns both of them stopping instead of muting it's just no need to have a mute in there and then just the then the trumpet can be muted and then you know yeah anyway that would just be a way of dealing with that but you know all this is fine um that's gonna work great all right now we're continuing on and we're just you know we're going to the do do dee boo dee 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 and and it's like once again, we're just continuing on with that pacing, and it's just getting pretty relentless. So I'm just like saying, you know, do you really want that much support there? Um, you know, it's just just kind of a thing where the it just becomes more and more noticeable to the listener, right? Um, if there's a way of backing off, like even if you have to keep going with it, sort of backing off a little bit and then bringing it back in stronger later. Um, yeah, but other than that, uh, it's cool to have. A tenor saxophone and a first bassoon working together. Yeah, yeah, and that's all. That's all going to sound pretty cool, actually. Um, and I love the way you know, just bring in a little bit of flute there. And this is going to work fine here, just like right in the, right in very easy registers to do these kinds of patterns for the strings, or those lower strings. Now. One of the problems with your timpani writing is that you are assuming unlimited pitches for your timpanist, right? You've got them going all the way over there. You've got a middle C here, which is really only possible 
with a um, with like a piccolo timpani. So you're asking for five timpani from this, right? Um, yeah. So and 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 also you you kind of have a situation here where you're doing soft, you know, kind of soft, more of a bass line. And one thing I could just really advise here, if there was one little maxim to take to heart, and that is that timpani is not a bass instrument, right? It is it is an instrument to uh, to emphasize the bass, uh, and it can be used in a bass function, but it is not not a bass instrument. Do you know what I mean? It's like it is not it is not an instrument that normally plays bass lines because like the bass line just becomes so powerful that it takes over the entire piece. In this case right here, if you want this exact same effect, just get rid of the timpani and just have the cellos play pizzicato, right? Then you get the same effect. Now right here, this is just wildly ambitious for these players. Um, it's, it's concerto writing, right? Concerto level virtuosity that you're asking from these section players here. So seeing as how G is the lowest note here, it would be easier to do this if you just really want the strings to play this. This entire thing gets moved up to the second, the first and second violins, so the seconds take over, like they'll maybe play the beginning of this up to say around, right around C, right? So like just, and then right on this C, dovetail to the firsts, right? And then here, have the seconds come back in and play this, and then the firsts play the last four notes, right? So, or, or you could have the first come in and play the beginning of it, and then the seconds play everything in the middle here, and then the firsts take over right at the end. Right? So there, there are different ways of, do, of dealing with this. But that would be one way to split this up. And then you could take a, like, as far as the cellos are concerned, and, and like, this could become a, a shared cello and viola part, right? So uh, cellos play up to this uh, B here, and then the violas take over, right? And then the cellos come in and they play this, and then the violas come in and they play that, right? They're dovetailing right on this F, right? So that would be one way of dealing with this and sort of splitting it and making sure that it was in the strings. Now, of course, you could avoid all that just by kind of giving it to, say, like, clarinet, you know, some of this to clarinet, maybe splitting up between the two bassoons, some of these patterns, or so, excuse me, some of these this uh, this arpeggiation, because they do that all day long, right? Now, now for instance, here, like you're trading off first and second, um, but it's really easier for the bassoonist to do, to just split up like this, like have the second play up to um, this B flat here, or this B, excuse me, and then have the first kind of take over and then trade off again, and then the second just kind of deal with the lower part. Or if you have really good bassoon players, you could have the first bassoonist on this and the second on, second on that, right? But like dividing in between the two, you're assuming that both bassoonists are equally good and are equally brilliant, right? And once again, we're getting somewhat into, into, um, into concerto quality scoring here, right? Uh, this, these trumpets are cool, they're going to somewhat drown out the clarinets because you're getting higher and higher with this. And here you've got just this is just an overwhelmingly strong um, way to start, right? You've got flutes and oboes and clarinets all doubling, you know, tripling on those pitches. You know, might mightn't it be a little bit easier just to have you know, maybe a contrast between two different sets of instruments. Maybe there's nothing at all happening except for flutes here and clarinets there, or flutes here and oboes there, right? And then it can just be clarinets all by itself, right? Plus, or, or plus trumpets, right? Or you could do flutes plus oboes and then clarinets plus trumpets, Right, but you're going to just start so strong and then it's going to drop off for some reason that the audience doesn't understand and then suddenly you're coming back in strong here, right? Uh, now, here, like, I think you needed to adjust the dynamic, right? You're just saying crescendo, but crescendo from what? It's been a long time since the horns played, right? So you have to say, what, piano crescendo, right? And then uh, sforzando on this, the last 
thing that they got was piano. So they, they'll assume sforzando will mean like a forte accent, right? Uh, but, but yeah, but you know, the brass is so strong in here in your mock-up that you can't really hear any of these other touches here the, in, your, in your metallic percussion, right? And then you got a very delicate line here with the harp, right? The harp cannot compete with this mass of tone here coming from you know, fairly high horns, right? If this is in C, then that B flat um, is actually written F, right? Is the is, which is the first note of the the highest group of notes for the horn, and which is hard to control dynamically, right? So it's all going to be very pungent. And so this is not the place. If if you really really want this harp, which is difficult, but it is playable. But if you really really want um, this harp line to stand out, then you've got to give this to way softer instruments, like just just toss all of your all of your um, brass right in here and have this played by uh, shared by flutes and then like a very soft clarinet on the bottom. And then this punch right here could be the oboes, right? And then you'll be able to hear all of these other elements. But there's just so forceful in tone um you know everything's so forceful in tone with the brass here that it you just cannot hear these delicate elements and then here you've got this running line here with the harps and that is just not you know it's very very difficult it is not harp types of writing right this this just continue well you know it's it, you know the that that frequent of repeating notes going back and forth is it's you know that what will happen is that the notes will get stomped this close together, right? This C followed so quickly by another C and another C. You'll just hear a lot of zzz, 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 as the fingertips of the of the harpist, you know, attempt to play those those strings one after another so quickly, right? Like if you really wanted like a very effective harp part, just have big gushing chords on each one of these other chords. So F crescendo, like. The harps, get, excuse me, the uh, um, the heavy brass getting louder and louder. Also, the harp will disappear, and so will the flutes. Did you notice that in your mock-up you could barely hear anything going on? Uh, and then you've got your diminuendo starting here, but the forte, or sorry, the, sorry, the crescendo just goes all the way to here. So you're in your mock-up, you're at fortissimo here, and you're at about mezzo piano right here, right? So you need to balance, just really work on the balance with some of this, right? And if you if you really want heavy brass to come in here, you've got to just bulk up everything else in the orchestra. This has got to be strings, maybe strings and octaves. Just forget about the uh, forget about the harp. Strings and octaves, um, uh, like doubled by winds and octaves, and uh, you know, and bringing in the lower strings to uh, to blend in and help to moderate some of what's going on in the in the uh, lower heavy brass uh, along with maybe some wind so it's just like it's a it's a massive jolt here of color and information and dynamics that isn't really balanced by what's going on around it right it's just the caution that i've got for you there okay and i've mentioned this a few times on some other recent scores that like this whole idea here but is really intended to be continued on um, in other parts, right? So bump da and da and da and but when it's just da lee 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 it you know and then uh, um then it doesn't quite um yeah you know, it, it just doesn't quite um enunciate anything in the other parts. And you know, this is great in bassoons, but this line right here, you know, you've got like you've got all of this stuff descending, and you've got only one instrument, like tenor sax, which is cool. I just love your use of the tenor sax in this movement, by the way. It's a very original idea, and you know, maybe doubled with cellos would be good, right? Just to kind of bring the line out a little bit. Uh, and you know, here you've got um, you've got oboe and clarinet, and both sets of um, both sets of violins plus viola at an octave lower, all sitting right on that, right? Maybe it would have been a good time if, since we're just cutting back down to a very soft dynamic to try to balance this out a little bit and make it a little bit more delicate. This is great on harp though. Don't don't trade that for anything. And then a little tish right at the top, 
that's also nice. And it's just something that I had not seen in, in other arrangements or very many other arrangements. So we're continuing on with that same exact thing. Now, as the tenor sax gets higher and higher, it's going to get uh, more and more uh, sort of brazen in quality, um, brassy in quality. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that's just a, it's a place where the cellos, you know, could be climbing up into their tenor register or you, or the octaves that you intend here in the, uh, violins, like the lower octave, this, this viola part could be played by the second violins. And then the violas could be used to kind of help out with the rising line. Like you could have violas on this tenor sax part and then cellos doubling these pitches here. Right, so just just a way of kind of like keeping things more um, more organized, more uh, more balanced throughout. But yeah, this is great. This harp part should be marked up, you know, forte, whatever. Just like it has to really cut through everything else. But this is fun. You've got our little frolicking part here, right? So. Um, everything is getting serious and tense and everything, and now that Mussorgsky is just going to, you know, uh, have the seamstress have some happy moments, right? So, uh, where she just really feels in the groove and things are getting done and, and yeah, and she's kind of looking at her work order of fancy dresses to stitch up and feeling great about it. Uh, this is nice. I like the little horns right in here. Bum, 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 bum. And yeah, tuba, this is more, I mean, okay, tuba can do that fine, okay, just like control, drop the tuba into the background, right? So if this is mezzo forte, that should be mezzo piano, right? So mezzo piano on tuba, timpani, and horn, right? And then when you get to forte here, mezzo forte on tuba and timpani, just to just to keep them from dominating and and also from on the horns right because they just can just take over a texture so easily like you know uh i really love this you know just doing this these patterns right in here now it gets really high here i mean is there any reason why this couldn't just be um a uh, second violin here and violas right there right right or even just keep this in this in the violins entirely right but you're asking the the cello players to just go way high up there. I mean, this is so high that it's the kind of place where I would, you know, I would want to score treble clef rather than uh, than tenor clef, right? If you anything that gets up to C above middle C, you should start using the treble clef, right? And then and it just gets insanely high, right? So yeah, so just. You know, just be smart about this, right? Just just score this for your violins, right? And then you have no problems. But the the except for the problem that we've got like no support. Like here we've got all this wonderful support from I hope A two flutes, right? And then we got our little um, our little patterns, but there's no support from patterns by anybody. These clarinets aren't doing anything. They could be helping out with that, right? And then here you've got all of this mass here on this higher stuff. Well, let's just assume, right? All right, and get rid of this too. And you then you can like tell your cellos to do something else. All right, so we have this kind of stuff in need of support, right? As like Glockenspiel is contributing and you know, we've got some tenor sax pulling away. But like, look at this. Like, this this note will be heard, but these D's, right? It's just so weak in a two T, right? Why not just um, right? Problem solved, right? And you could have, yeah. I mean, the flutes can play that for that long, right? Um, yeah. So I mean, there are ways of 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 balancing this out and and you know adding support where you want and like even this is pretty weak right you could get rid of this and you could give it to the clarinets right and still have that really firm sound right in here or you could have like you have this um
Oops. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't anticipating that. All right, so um, yeah, so you could score it like that. And that way you have support for your strings uh, and much, much clearer and, and can really push this crescendo with those uh, concert Gs, right? And then that leaves, uh, you know, with this tenor sax line, you can just give it to um, cellos and violas if you want to, right? See, problem solved. So, so, like, with all of this advice that I'm giving you, Miranda, um, you know, it's not really saying that your scoring is bad or that, like, you have, you don't have good ideas. You've got great ideas. But it's just you really need to work on balance, right? You've got some really cool ideas in terms of texture and function, right? But like the the balancing out of them, and also the proportion, right? That's a proportion is a is a it's a part of it's all a part of balance, which you know can be balancing the uh, things like you know how much how much timpani do you want to add, or how much do you want to emphasize that you know the baton stroke, right? Um, okay. Um, yeah, and we've got a little touch of our Borodin waltz there, and then back and forth. Bop, 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 bop. Um, and yeah, and then here, glockenspiel, uh, harp roll. This should be marked fortissimo, and so, so should this. Right? And you just have this. The, the only problem that you've got here is that the, um, the, the concert hall is just going to be echoing with these massive blasts, especially from the timpani, right? And so the ear of the listener is going to have to suddenly condense down to this smaller, uh, this smaller sound here. So if there's any way to support this line just for a second, you know, like maybe, you know, a touch of high flute, just doubling the glockenspiel for a second, um, <clears throat> maybe like some pizzicato or just a, like a, maybe a, a accented arco from the violins that would just really help this you know in in terms of just making it more audible but without changing its character at all but i think there's also a missed opportunity in here for the strings to be supporting what's going on in brass and winds here now this is all really really great until it gets down to here and once you get below middle c on a glockenspiel the tones, the timbres become very um, sort of funky, right? They don't have that same um, beautiful openness above, as, as you hear above middle C, they just really become kind of like overbuilt, if you know what I mean. So if, like, if you had Celesta, like this line would work perfectly on Celesta because that's still within the range of really beautiful, nicely proportioned bells. I'm using the word proportioned a lot, excuse me for that. But yeah, but now we're kind of going back to those, you know, kind of a lot of thumping. And that kind of fits because of what's coming up, right? And that's all very cool. Um, works pretty well. Yeah, you know, it, it, it almost feels like this is, you know, these really extreme low notes. Well, you know, that's a written F, so that's no big deal, really. Um, yeah. That's all pretty good. Or F sharp, I should say. Or F. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Anyway. Yeah, written F sharp. Okay, and yeah, and this is just not a timpani part. Right? Because, I mean, look at how high you're pushing this timpani. Like you need a piccolo timpani, and and then then you have to retune. The player has to retune all their timpani in order to be able to play this, and then you're asking for all these different pitches. Just imagine that you have five possible. Look, let's just say four. Limit yourself to four. Limit yourself to the standard four timpani, and then like don't assume that you have to have to double everything exactly at pitch, right? You could do this perfectly fine if you had a D right in here, right? You could go D. F, B, right? And then right in here, you have still have that D, right? And then you, you still have the B, right? So you could go D here, B, excuse me, B here, D here, right? And then G sharp, right? But then, like, it doesn't really help you with this C sharp, 
right? And then you've got an A to deal with, right? So it's just really, you're just asking so much. When, when like pizzicato basses will give you almost exactly the same sound, right? I mean, you could ease off on, you could just have the, um, you could just have the um, the violas doing the pattern here. Get rid of this, all this huge stuff here on the cellos, and just have the cellos be doing pizzicato, and you're doing exactly what's needed here on timpani. And if you want that same, like, that same sense, uh, like the the tubas to help out, then have them play staccato, right? Rather than just holding down these notes. This is going to sound like a foghorn underneath these ac this accented shorter. Um, winds right it just really this just you're going to hear this very low bellow like here you go to staccato so you might as well put it here too right okay all right i'm not going to get too picky about it but yeah so you're you're um to back up a little bit um after we do this massive thing you've got you know, just looking at the way this is all scored it's nice that you've got these two open strings so that makes it really really playable you know, that is fantastic, okay? Um, and, you know, and this is, like, if you were to keep this in the violas, then it would just totally be playable, right? Because this, you know, you've got those open strings of C and G, right? That works really, really great, right? Now, not so much here with E and A. Now, the E and the A, you're going to have uh, as open strings in the cello uh, an octave higher from where it's scored, right? So there are ways of of working this out like this is this is a lot of work I've got to say like anything that doesn't have all these open strings when you're separating these parts the the player has got to hold like as a chord across fifths they've got to hold the pitches in their fingers uh, a little bit easier on cello when you can use your thumb as a as a backstop but still it's just a lot to just suddenly you know you're playing this very loud and you suddenly have to jump to this right so it's a situation where divisi cello is like with one of the you know one the top group of cellos sort of accenting like get, just taking care of the accents and then the the lower group of cellos just doing the kind of back and forth patterning then it solves all problems immediately right but yeah you're just really asking a lot from these players and this is like once again you separate if you separate this between two players both in the uh, both in the cellos and in the bassoons, then that can be an effective line, can be beautifully effective, right? And here's where the harp could be really just such an indispensable tool, right? Um, yeah, that, okay, some high tenor sax playing right in there. We got clarinet. Uh, first, uh, excuse me, second clarinet on the same pitch as the tenor sax. That's going to sound great. Uh, and here I would I would definitely slur these. Bum, ba, da, 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 da. Right, just like in, just lining up all of those, all of those different pitches, and then we got da 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 da. -da. Right, wouldn't this be cool to bring in some cymbal right here to sort of you know tish tish tish, some bass drum boom da da boom da da boom da da. Yeah, and here, um, I don't know if you recall the piano score, but everything is an octave lower, right? So. Wouldn't it be kind of cool to bring that here and like give the ear some kind of relief, right? Some kind of um, contrary stuff. A lot of people were treating this as like playing this section higher, divided amongst the clarinets and maybe violas supporting uh, violas and violins and so on. <clears throat> and then, then when you get to here, then things can be lower, and you could bring down some of these melodic uh, pitches as well, right? You could like just have flutes a two on the higher pitch, oboes a two on the lower pitch, and then you know, then you and then bring down these clarinets as well, and tenor saxophone could drop an octave, right? Um, and then you have your lower answer, right, to the original question. Just one little bit of advice about these. Um, if just just as a favor to me, if you can stick with the engraving style of you know A, B, and C, whatever this was probably um, you probably used my template and um, and transposed it or did whatever to it, which is cool. If you can stick with the engraving style of of uh, the the rehearsal letters, that's really really helpful to me. 
uh, you know, at the appropriate places in the score. That's just awesome. Just a couple more pages to go. Okay, now this is kind of like a mini climax, right? So the major climax was before. Um, and so, so yeah, and here is where I feel this is also a missed opportunity. Um, I feel that you could have brought, you could have made this into a massive tutti here. You got some good instincts there with your, um, with some of your brass writing. Uh, pretty high notes here for the for the tr trumpet, but not horribly scored, right? Just imagine the fullness of, of uh, you know, some chords here from the uh, from the strings, um, some some bass that you know in the lower strings in the in the lower winds that doesn't poop out you know um like this could be um uh, this could be a tremolo in your uh, double basses and cellos um you know, there's just so much that you could do here but i will say having said that having said all of that this is so beautiful the way that you score this um, and, and just like the lovely contrast between the brass that happened before and, you know, just this is so nice. Just the way this is all voiced and the way it's all sitting and everything else. It's just really lovely. Um, you would still need to balance some of this stuff out, you know, like soft oboe plus clarinet. So is it is this a two with one each or whatever? I would say just a single player on each note just to kind of really try to balance things out. And the tenor sax in there brings in a lovely quality. Uh, just, yeah, so nice, Miranda. Just like, this is my favorite part of the entire arrangement that you submitted. And this harp is pretty fast, but I mean, it's still kind of sort of usable, right? And you'd have to mark it up to like forte or even fortissimo, right? Just to really get it to, you know, forte would be good. And just write solo over it. This is all nice, very, very cool, and just lovely little glockenspiel line. Now you're really giving everything to the harp at the end, and that can be a little risky, okay? But the dynamics are right, and I like this just little pop right at the end here. Uh, and that's also fairly nicely scored. Uh, good to have mutes on that. And, you know, everybody can just really play really soft. So, so I hope that that was... Uh, all of the that feedback was useful to you and you know it, it's it's been kind of cool having you like as a supporter just been so great um and and to you know to be able to read your score give you some feedback on it um and i'm just thinking with these some of these wonderful textures these wonderful textural ideas that you've got like what you could do with the 2020 orchestration challenge um you know th that you know, there are so many things that resonate, like in some of your approaches here with some of the passages in that score. Um, I think it might be really useful. So, yeah, I mean, if you can, if you can contribute to that, if you have the time, um, you know, I understand that you're just starting to get going on your composing career and you're, you know, you're getting to writing some serious stuff, trying to get it published and performed. And that is awesome. I mean, you obviously have the talent. It's just, you know, getting some of the information, getting working out some of the balance and the proportions, and and you know, putting that together with some of your great ideas about, um, you know, about your texture and and some of your ideas about function and stuff, and just you know, just watch out for asking the players to do things that are too difficult, right? And the other thing I would do is just like say score read, score read, score read, just really score read the heck out of everything, and. Um, you know, just really increase your mastery of what instruments can do. And not just about what instruments can do if you really, really ask them what to do, but like what they can do like in, you know, doing hours of playing every night. My wife is um, is currently playing a weekend of gigs um, kind of on tour or kind of out of town. And she was the first hornist and she usually plays like second horn or fourth horn which is like a low horn but she was playing um you know she was rehearsing and her chops were just completely falling apart and it was just because she had like she had to play three concerts worth of stuff and she got it together for the concerts like when the actual performances but like they was brutal they were you know she had to rehearse three hours of music 
to be performed um, over three per separate performances, and some of it was just massive, you know. So, so like, could she play concerto type stuff on her her horn, in you know, for for a few bars here and there? Probably, you know. What would be the consequence of taking that time to do that to learn those bars that just come and go in a second, right? So it's up to you to be really wise as a as a as an arranger and an orchestrator and just try to think about you know what are things that like what are parts that i can write orchestrally symphonically in this style um that that use the instruments at their best and are, have the highest chance of being accepted and performed you know, by a conductor who will also be looking for those things and saying oh wow there's some really hard writing in here i don't think my orchestra has time to rehearse that or sound good right even if it is a perfectly possible part, right? So think about all that stuff, and you know, thanks so much for your support on Patreon and for your involvement in the community and everything else. And it really, really is appreciated. And I'm so glad that you shared the score with us. Mm -hmm.